interview are sponsored by The Broken Binding. The Broken Binding is a new and wonderful indie bookstore. And I suggest that you guys check them out because they sell a lot of great signed books. And to, uh, for this month's book of the month is The Stormblood by Jeremy Cezal. And here, here he is. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and uh, in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of this interview, there will be a worldwide giveaway of Stormblood. Yeah, and Jeremy will give you the password, and all you have to do is comment what he said in the comment sections. And that's it. And now we will begin the conversation. And so, Jeremy, please tell us a bit about yourself and about your debut, Stormblood. Um, okay, I'm Jeremy Zal. I live in, as you can probably tell from my accent. Uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, I wrote uh, this book that you saw, Stormblood. It's basically, the, it's best described as Blade Runner 2049 crossed with Mass Effect 2. Nice. It's about the DNA of extinct aliens. It's used as a drug and it makes people addicted to adrenaline and aggression. Uh, it's certainly larger space opera slash cyberpunk slash military sci-fi mm. slash gothic sci-fi uh, world basically it's set on this giant asteroid with that endless cities stacked on top of each other with all these different alien races living in uh, not quite so nice harmony together um, but fundamentally the book is about uh, found families it's about brotherhood it's about uh, you know it's about the, the horror it's about what war does to the individual it's about trauma and so I, it's very much a character-driven space opera. It's a character-driven book. You know, I think it's a little bit hard when you're describing your book. You want to talk about all the cool ideas and all the really <laughs> nice, really inspirations you had. But for, at, the end of, at the end of the day, the book is about characters and it's about the main character and his relationship with his brother and his relationship with this really messed up, sticky alien DNA that's now hardwired to his nervous system and how it basically makes him want to makes him want to punch people's through a wall uh, <laughs> to get high when they rub him off the wrong way and how he's got to try and not do that because for some <laughs> reason it's not a, you're not allowed to do that for some reason in society <laughs> so that's, um, that's what the book pretty much fundamentally is and yeah it's a that's that's me yeah, and how long did uh, how long did it take you to write Stormblood? And unfortunately, after writing for so long, I assume uh, you have to debut in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, how has it been going for you? And what would you say is the biggest struggle for you in the past and right now in writing? Uh, well, let's <laughs> see. Debuting in 2020. Mm. Uh, well, to answer your first question, it took me six months to write Stormblood. It took me longer to edit it, but oh. I, yeah, it took me six months to write it. Like, honestly, I was only working two or three days a week. Uh, and so I had plenty of time. And so I go down with my computer uh, to my beachside cafe near where I live. And I just pound out 3,000, 4,000 words. Wow. Wow. Uh, and yeah, I wrote it in six months. I didn't really know what I was doing. I ran out of plot halfway through the book, but because, <laughs> of char but because the character arcs weren't done and so I had to come up with more stuff on the fly. Um, but it's, it's one of those books that's flawed and it's in its own unique, it's got its unique charm to it. Like I can see where, you know, I started winging, winging it a little and now some stuff was pre-planned, but it somehow all meshed together and worked in the end and I wouldn't have done it in any, any other way. But yeah, I did really did bash it out in six months. Uh, there was a previous book that I got my agent with that was, I wrote it in three months. Wow. Uh, but yeah, but it didn't end up selling, but this one did. So that should tell you, that should, that says it all really. Um, <laughs> but no, to tell you, but yeah. Um, debuting in 2020 is interesting. I was initially originally supposed to come out in February, but we had to delay it to June because of editing reasons, and we all know how that turned out. Uh. Uh, especially <laughs> as my my book came out on the very same week as Blackout Day in America when oh. they were having all the riots. Oh damn! So, you, so that was that was excellent. I had some people saying this is probably the worst week in history to have a book come out. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. 
Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, like could the world just stop being trash for like a, a week so we could all enjoy good stuff seriously? Um, but no, it's it's been difficult because uh-huh. first of all, you know, science fiction doesn't sell anywhere near too much as fantasy. And the moment I say science fiction, yeah, I know I have a lot of fantasy folks running for the hills, and I don't blame <laughs> them. Because- because they think tech in for dumps and lots of boring space physics and techno- 70s technology described badly. So I actually do have to go. That's why I use a Mass Effect reference. So they're like, oh, good. The character is not artboard. Mass Effect is a great seller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I use it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 probably about as close to the closest reference I can honestly think of. Hmm. But yeah, that's why I mention it a lot. Um, but yeah, it, it's been very difficult. As I was saying earlier before we started this interview, in Australia, it's not quite as detrimental as other places like i'm tomorrow i'm doing a really i'm going through the city and i'm doing a really big signing for the uh, mass market paperback that came out just a couple of weeks ago so i'm going to three or four stores um i've done signings i'm probably going to be attending a type type of comic-con uh convention that's happening later this year uh in a few months time yeah and so it's it's not been too badly it's been doing very well in australia you know i'll go to any shopping center or any place and they'll have my book and i'm able to sign it and people have been buying it and that's great um but it has made it very very difficult to reach new readers and on being online is crucial like i mean it was crucial beforehand marketing but it's even more crucial now like i don't think you could survive as an author in 2020 uh, and it's and it's also difficult as well because you get a lot of people saying, "Well, I only read books that the, when the series is finished," and it <laughs> oh. drives me mental. Uh, uh, it makes me uh, want, that is annoying. Um, <laughs> makes me want to tear the planet in half with my fingernail, <laughs> honestly. And it's really and they say it to your face, and they say it to you, like tell it to you, and like, "Oh, you know what? I'm not going to buy. Like, it's not finished," and it just drives me mental. But, you know, and so you are competing with that and you are competing with people who, you know, forgo that rule when it's Sanderson or Rothfuss or whatever. Yeah. But so you are competing with a lot of stuff is sacked against you. And every debut that I know this year has been suffering from that and has found it difficult to cope with this year. Yeah. And uh, but fortunately, I think a lot of readers have very, been very understanding of that they've gone out of their way to support independent bookstores which is amazing they've gone out of the way to seek new writers and seek new voices new series and that's definitely been excellent mm. uh you know there's all, you always wanted to be do, be doing better yeah. but the book is actually doing better than my publisher thought it would be and they made those projections before covid so it's uh-huh. it's been doing very well and I've had a lot of support like Nicola Seams, mm-hmm. who I'm a massive, massive fan of, blurbed it uh, and a few folks like that. And so th- it, it's definitely been a, com- a community effort and I'm very, very, very grateful for it. Yeah. And, you know, I, if it was in my power to get rid of this pandemic, I would. I would do it for you. <laughs> I would do it for you. But alas, alas, though, it is out of my powers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So we have to stick with online stuff, unfortunately. It is quite insane though, right? Uh, that a lot of times that the people who said that I will not be buying a book series until it's completed, it is only because of two series, only because of two, usually. It's yeah. Home of Ice and Fire and The King Killer Chronicle. That's two only. But yeah. statistically, a lot of authors do finish their series. So that Absolutely is not, they do. Yeah, that is not a good reason not to start or if you're interested already, at least buy the books. At least that's yeah, I how I do it. Yeah, don't have to read it. Like I've yeah. got a ton of books. I've got a ton of books on my shelf that I haven't started yet. Like I've had um Scott Lynch's series for yeah. three years on my shelf and I've just started reading them, but yeah. I'm not going to not support him. Yeah. You know, that would be absurd. And let me just say this because I'm because I need to be a while I've got while I'm on my soapbox. If you go and say, I'm not going to buy a book until it's finished. And then you go to the stores one day and you wonder, hmm, there's only the book's first book published. Why isn't the rest been published? Well, no one bought the first book. So they literally couldn't afford to publish the third book. Yeah. So it's a, 
it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's an evil, it's a self, it's a circle. So yeah, it buy any like I'm not just referring to saying this because I want people to buy my book. Buy anyone's book. That's the first in the series. Vote with your wallets is basically yeah. what I'm saying. I think that's important. I mean, that's why I do it. I mean, I can get pretty much any book for free, but I do continue to buy books because I want to support all authors and authors and support their careers. I mean, where would we be if we just had the giants? Yeah, you know, no, that's the, the genre would be much poor for it for sure. Mm. And uh, recently, Peter McLean, the author of Priest of Bones and Priest of Life, said, see that. "Yeah, he said he said the same thing about this." And it is crazy because I thought his books were selling pretty well, and that seems to be not enough now because of the current situation. He's almost, yeah, definitely. It's almost not. Yeah, it, he's almost discontinued. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, crazy. Stuff. American publishers are American publishers are especially harsh towards that uk not so much but american polish a uh, uh, draconian, uh, <laughs> draconian. Comes yeah no it's an appropriate word for it when it comes to sales and books and what they choose to continue and so oh. it, you can very much see a series discontinued because of piracy or because it just isn't selling and so that's why i honestly think it's so important to support new authors and new voices and new and things like that because it is it's a it's crazy out there and especially in 2020 you know i mean that we've he we've heard people saying you know all you know bookstore records numbers have shot up and you know books that are selling at a record rate and that's true mm -hmm. they are for the most part buying the popular authors or the most most part buying the big names yeah they're not so much looking for um, the smaller names like my book is not available in physical format in the US like I've had people say that they've had to buy used copies on eBay and get them shipped from Europe to wow. get a copy of my book in America yeah yeah and I'm grateful because at least they get to read it I don't make any money off it because it's second hand but they get to read it and I'm I'm happy for them but it's so it's hard it is very yeah. difficult yeah Damn. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, a lot of bad things happen to Vakov, uh, the main character in Stormblood. And there's a lot of great actions, but at its core, as you mentioned, Stormblood is about brotherhood. Has this always been the plan from the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. I can actually remember with surprising clarity when I was outlining the the broad strokes of the book and the narrative and the direction it would take, mm -hmm. uh, the nature of brotherhood was always prevalent in every section. You know, it was whether if it was the character's drive, the what would take him to the next plot point, what convinced him to do the things he did, what you know, what made his motivation, what altered his decisions, what drove his decisions. All of that was rooted in. Uh, his his love for his brother and his relationship with his brother and his friendship and his uh, the nature of his relationship with the people that are very close to him, um, you know, and I that was always what I wanted to do because the character I wrote Faka Faka Sawa, mm -hmm. he's I deliberately wrote him to be, you know, not qu not quite an antihero, more along, but he was you know he's not exactly knight in shining armor, he's not exactly a great guy in every respect you know he's Ill, you know i guess the closest a comparison you could make was a slightly more gritty version of the mandalorian mm. uh, character you know he does a, he does things he shouldn't but he's a good guy at heart he's a he's a rat bag but he wants to do the right thing yeah <laughs> so i was worried that people wouldn't like him or warm up to him um but the the fact that he has a brother that he loves and he's had this very difficult and rocky relationship that's been damaged you know, hopefully not permanently, hopefully not forever, but has been damaged and he's desperately trying to fix it. And so I knew that would be the drive. And I I told myself that this book is going to be character driven. I am not going to worry about plot. I am not going to worry about what gets him to point from point A to point B. What matters is why he's going from point A to point B. He's going for his brother. He's going because he wants to fix things. He's going because there are people that he loves that he wants to do right by. And so that's why I, I really didn't pay attention to the plot mechanics. It was all about um, why he decided why he was going and yeah. the people that he was going for. 
And as I was writing it, thing uh, the the relationship evolved. I discovered things that I didn't really know before, uh, especially in the flashback sequences. Like uh-huh. those things, I I didn't really plan on like the whole thing. I don't know if you remember Patrick because it's yeah. been a little while since you read it. I think the whole thing with the uh, Babushka and his and that he had to his how he got revenge for his sister on his sister's killer and Uh and the other things like that that was completely written on the spur of the moment absolutely not pre-planned in the slightest but it just came and no it just came i just sat down one day and i'm like you know what i'm gonna do that Uh and so that and so that it definitely did evolve i it wasn't really pre-planned methodically i just thought this feels right this feels like something he would do so I'm going to do it. I mean, one of the criticisms I've seen of the book, and this is a criticism you see of a lot of books, is like, you know, why does the main character go running into danger? Why does he just let himself be caught? Well, first of all, he's literally addicted to <laughs> danger. He literally gets high on doing bad things. Yeah. What do you expect? Second, if he didn't, it'd be a pretty boring book. So, <laughs> Thirdly, he's doing it before his brother. He's not doing it because, yes, I have to get this, save the world. No, yeah. he doesn't care about saving the world. Not at first, anyway. Mm. He wants to save his brother. He wants to do right by him. He wants to clear his name. And so that's that drives his motivation. And that was very important. And I honestly do not think the book will be half as good as it is if it was missing that element. You yeah. know, I think I would made a serious mistake if i left that out yeah i think i have to agree with that because if not it it will be just all mindless actions and the character, yeah. the characters need motivations and that is that is a good one yeah yeah like there was this just very quickly there was this one book that i read and someone basically said they described this book as saying it's kind of like inception except the leonardo dicaprio's character doesn't have a wife he doesn't want to get back to his kids he doesn't want to do right by his team. He doesn't have a junior trainee. He just wants to fulfill his company role. And I'm like, you know what? That's exactly what it was like reading it. You know, and, and you know, if I like, and it would be a serious, serious mistake to not have a character that you root for in your heart. Because at the end of the day, I think that's what the majority of people do read for. Exactly. And so, yeah, I was, I was very determined to make sure that was on point mm, yeah and i have to agree that the book is better for it <laughs> and uh is becoming an author something that you've always wanted to do since you were a child or is this something that's quite recent no i, I uh, always have i remember even when i was um 11 12 years old and i was living in austria at the time uh-huh. and i still remember writing sitting at my parents a uh, creaky old laptop and just pounding out stories because I had nothing better to do. And I didn't speak <laughs> the language snowing and, you know, desperately like trying to emulate the stories that I read and wrote. Um, and I always, I always loved the idea. I mean, I wrote the, the first five sequels before I even finished the first <laughs> book. How does that work? <laughs> I, don't know. I was 12, mate. I'm 12. I don't even know. I, I'm, I don't even know what I was doing through two years ago, let alone half my age. Um, no, and then I dropped the whole writing thing for a little bit. And then I was in high school and I read the uh, Song of Ice and Fire series and I watched the show and I really started then thinking about fantasy and science fiction as genres. You know, I never really uh, split genres in my mind you know i liked crime i knew that i liked adventure but i never really thought okay this is fantasy this is not you know i read stephen king i read artemis fowl i read a bunch of other stuff that i and i never really separated in my mind but then once song of ice and fire came along i started thinking yes this is fantasy i started playing halo quite a bit once i got my xbox and you know started reading all the halo books yes this is science fiction this is space uh, military sci-fi yes is a space opera this is sort of stuff I want to do and so I started writing my own books and you know I, I wrote a bunch of them and they didn't get anywhere and I made quite a big mis- a few mistakes let's just say I sent my first book out to about 200 agents uh, I 
<laughs> yeah, I was a madman back then. Not a kid with nothing better to with summer from school and nothing better to do than to just make agents shake in the boots <laughs> when I saw my email. Um, but then I wrote another book and it didn't really go anywhere. And then I wrote a fantasy book and then I got two thirds of in the way into it. And I'm like, I hate fantasy. I never want to write fantasy again. Mm. I only started writing fantasy because I thought, well, fantasy sells. It's much better. Why fantasy, especially. So I'll just write that uh. big, big, mistake. big mistake. And I'm like, I am done with fantasy. And then I'd finished university at the time and I was wondering, okay, do I want to launch into the full-time in work industry or what I want to work part-time mm. uh, and just to support myself and take one more crack at it. Yeah. And I did. And that was a book that got me an agent. So oh. yeah, it was long, long road. Uh, you're not really long road. I mean, I got an agent. <clears throat> I got my agent when I was 21. I got the book deal when I was 22. So not exactly a long road, <laughs> uh, I would say. Um <laughs> My my pe- my mom sometimes says to me whenever I'm lament whenever I used to lament about how long it's taking, she's like, "You have you like there are people who have been trying to get books published longer than you've been alive. Be quiet." <laughs> and like you know, like, you're right, you're right. Um, yeah, and so, but I've always wanted to be an author, and so even you know, going to a bookstore and seeing my name on the bookshelf and going flicking through the book and seeing every word mm. that I've loved and polished and crafted and it's and it's there forever in people's homes and on the shelves and in public in the in the wild is just it's a thrill that I hope I never get tired of. Yeah, I hope so. And there is still more to come in your series. <laughs> Absolutely two more books. Nice. At the very least, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, this is for the worldwide giveaway. So Jeremy, Jeremy will now give you the password and all you have to do is command what he said in the comment sections. So go. Yeah, just AI rabbit. Yeah, you get that? AI rabbit, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, the next question is, uh, what would you consider as the biggest inspirations behind Stormblood? And this can be maybe books, movies, video games, and authors. Or maybe uh, is there any real life setting that inspires Stormblood? Um, well, there is. In to answer your last question first, there is a really big part of uh, the asteroid called the Upper Markets, and that's very, very much inspired by this massive shopping complex in Bangkok, Thailand, that I think you know called MBK Center. Uh-huh. Uh, basically, you know, it's this massive shopping complex that has a hundred thousand people pass through it at least, like all like every day every i think, day, it's I think like, yeah. every day hundred thousand people come through it you know you've got one floor is you know counterfeit counterfeit douchey bags the next <laughs> floor counterfeit dvds the next floor is all these electronics and gaming hardware and computers the next door is furniture the next floor is uh the food court yeah. the next floor is you know all the uh, jewelry and clothes and it's it's a beautiful, it's beautiful chaos. It's people yeah. from 50 countries. It's a hundred different types of products. It's ranging from plastic crap to <laughs> state-of-the-art hardware that you you could not get in a first world country. You know, you've got food stores, you've got, you know, these tiny little booths selling every piece of, every sort of cable and every sort of phone that's yeah. ever been conceived on planet earth. And, you know, and it's, it's just madness, but it works and it works. And I love going there. And every time I'm in Thailand, I always go and visit there. Mm. And so that kind of mad seething chaos where you've got, you know, kind of, kind of transplanted I, to my asteroid a bit where you have these dozens of alien species all clamoring together. You've got counterfeit goods being sold. You've got yeah. genuine goods. You've got you know, you've got these alien spices being sold next to Korean noodle houses. <laughs> that's next to a next to a computer store. Then it's next to a store that sells spacesuits. Next to a store that sells AIs. Next to a store that sells cutting edge armor. Next to a store that sells, uh, you know, wood carved furniture. You know that madness, that patchwork mosaic, um, is more very much my vision of the future. Because I actually don't, I think that's something that's very clinical and very orderly. Mm. First of all, doesn't really make sense. Isn't that interesting? And seeing a future that's just dystopian nightmare everywhere is first of all, unrealistic Mm. and not that interesting either. And so I wanted to have the good with the bad 
the madness with the organized and to just lose yourself in that as a setting uh so but otherwise um i think halo is definitely a very big inspiration Ooh. uh you know especially the whole suits of armor thing is definitely uh -huh. where you know i wasn't really sure when i was writing stormblood like can i actually have a character who's basically encased in a full suit of armor and sits in cafes <laughs> and bars <laughs> and in the same armor that he goes and battles people with yeah. uh but then the mandalorian came out like a few months before my book was out came out and i don't think anyone would <laughs> dare have a problem with it so yeah. all good um but yeah halo definitely inspired it you know the whole you know really evil alien race that's uh the whole armored soldiers that have been bio augmented i think that there were the back part of the backstory where harmony ended up kidnapping children or mm. kidnapping uh teenagers who showed like they would be good uh, there would be prime experiments for the reaper program where they injected this alien dna in them and made them super soldiers that was yet yeah, more or less i realize now is lifted from halo mm -hmm. uh transplanted where they actually did that created spartans that way they didn't create them to fight the alien race they created them to fight insurrectionists uh mm -hmm. on off world they created them to fight revolutionaries but somehow that but there was conveniently the aliens showed up and they had an excuse to utilize them so that was pretty much it's a spy from halo um the other obviously big inspiration is mass effect yeah <laughs> well, you do have yeah you do have all these different aliens species you know with the who with the quirks uh who also have you know they have the personalities they have a sense of humor but they're still alien um that, i think that's one of my biggest complaints in science fiction when you do have aliens they're if they exist at all they're very aloof or beyond human understanding or beyond you know so the science of it is so hard that they're just basically a few relics and a few ruins left and if they do appear they're these lofty beings that are so infinitely beyond human comprehension we can't communicate with them at all mm. or they're evil and want to suck our brains out through our no nostrils like an alien <laughs> i i try to go through the middle ground I try to have aliens that, you know, still have to wear environmental suits and still have to get their scales trimmed and still have, pro you know, annoyed, dislike other species because of some personal offense or what is a uh, cultural personal offense or whatever, but they still have a sense of humor. They still have personalities. They still have these needs and emotions and feelings like any other characters do, mm. which is why in Blind Space, the sequel, there's two two of the main cast are aliens. Uh -huh. One of them you've met already, Juvens, the guy with the horns, the uh -huh. kaiju with the horns. And um, <laughs> yeah, so writing the dialogue was uh, was a lot of fun, making them argue about stuff. And so that definitely was a big inspiration. You know, you've got this far-flung future society that's scattered all along the solar system. You know, we have these amazing cities. We have this great technology. We have all these aliens interacting. We have council we have you know really sharp politics but at the same time we still have human greed we'll still have tragedy we still have you know smugglers and human traffickers and evil genocidal aliens that want to turn us all into husks you know <laughs> casual far future flung first world problems yeah uh, and so that's that's very that was very very much big inspiration to me um yeah another i think we're going to talk about it a little bit more later but the red rising series definitely inspired quite oh, a bit yeah. but i'll let you get onto that first maybe yeah so yeah speaking of red rising we are both fans of red rising saga a huge fans we are both fellow yeah. howlers right <laughs> and i do get the breakneck speed and uh actions that uh pierce brown has in his writing in your book and would you say that he is one of the biggest inspiration behind stormblood and maybe the series oh. Oh, absolutely. He's definitely the biggest literary inspiration uh, behind my series. You know, one thing I, I re remember reading Red Rising around the time I was writing that YA fantasy that I hated that I told you about. <laughs> and that was kind of what I realized because I realized, okay, you know, this book, it's, it's set in a far future society. It's edgy, it's vicious, but at the same time, you have a character with heart, you have a character that changes, mm. you have a character that isn't a psychopath where he could be, he's a character that always has a moral moral force to him, he's a moral gravitational center, 
Yeah. And I really enjoyed that because it made, he had an emotional texture and that made everything he said and did in a completely new and interesting light. Uh, and whereas without it, he would look like a maniac, but yeah. you have that interiority. Yeah, you but you have that interiority. You have his reasons, you have his his emotional context. And so that was very much you know, inspiration. And then I read the rest of the series and the fact that Pierce Brown is able to combine you know, this basically this far future society that's very much a vicious dystopia, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not misery. You know, you've got those heartwarming moments. You've got those emotions. You've got people trying to be better, no matter exactly. what you've got people always fighting against their instincts. You've got people mixing horror with humor, you, with you, these dr moments of dread with heart. You've got people, you've got these moments you know, these spectacular moments of action, but mm. they're undercut with these moments of heart that people change, people have these shifting alliances, people make forge friendships that are so unlikely and they find redemption. And that is what makes this series so great. And that's what I definitely took out of, you know, in making a, a book that was very much breakneck, a mm. breakneck uh, pacing. And that you had this massive world that was very dark and full of a lot of really messed up stuff and and potential for misery but it never sunk to that level because you had friendship mm. you know the friendship between dara and severo is one of my favorites oh, in all the of best, one of the best i could read a <laughs> whole book series just filled with them getting up to shenanigans <laughs> you know, know. And that, yeah and that's what i wanted to take out of it you know it wasn't just misery or doom and gloom you know you did have terrible things happening you had the characters going through hell but it, the friendship was stronger for it. You had them changing as a result and it was organic and they started trusting each other and learning to grow. I would say I'm much more inspired by his first trilogy than his next one, uh, particularly Dark Age. And I, I read your review of it quite a few times and I agree hundred percent with it. Yeah. And <laughs> I, the reason that I particularly agree with it is because I went through a small phase where I was trying to emulate Dark Age I didn't finish it at the time, but I was trying to emulate it with the second book. I was trying to make it filled with as much dread and tension as possible. Things getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And you just felt the tension piling. But then as I started, kept reading Dark Age, I just felt, I, okay, I'm very much on edge about what's going to happen. I fear for the characters, but I don't care for them as much as I would like to exactly. and i know he can do he can do it because he did it a shockingly good job in the first trilogy mm. but he's not trying to do this as much in the second it's not as if he's an incompetent writer that would be oh. ludicrous he's very yeah. much a competent writer but that's not what he was going for exactly. but personally i don't think it was effective in it's in the character department i think it was very much action driven and plot driven and the whole the heartwarming the mix of heartwarming and horror the mix of terrible tragedy and friendship and uplifting camaraderie was not was a little was very much diluted in dark age and so as i realized that that's part of the reason why this book got delayed because i realized i can't do this i have to make people care mm. i have to make i have to sell this friendship and so the majority of some of my edits have has sometimes just been um writing stuff in that I took out originally because I would have these scenes of banter and humor and I take it out because oh no it's it's messing with the pacing it's messing with with the with the dread it's messing with the tension but oh. these the scenes of banter made you care about these people and if you exactly. don't care about who's going to win the fight what's the point of having a fight and so that that's so that's why I've been really pretty much I pretty much spent a year rewriting and rewriting and polishing book two and i think it's much better for it um but this isn't you know and you know i'm not trying to dismiss pierce brown at all because i am a massive massive fan and i will it read <laughs> i thought he would describe paint drying and i will read it but personally that that's my perspective but i think that you know especially golden sun and morning star have that oh god those perfect books. lightning wow uh, lightning and yeah exactly lighting lightning in a bottle um that it's very very hard to emulate and i've tried my best um with this book and the next book but yeah to answer your question pierce brown has definitely inspired my stuff like no other author has yeah. and uh you know, especially six. 
Sorry? Cannot wait for Bo oh, Nix. Yeah. Oh man, I'm I'm scared. I'm <laughs> genuinely scared what he's going to do. Because he's a maniac. Like he is a maniac, that man. Like I want to borrow his brain. Uh, I'm scared of it. But I yeah, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it as well. But yeah, yeah I it, I've definitely lifted a lot of inspiration, you know, and I honestly don't think it would be the same if I hadn't read Red Rising series. And my book would be the same, you know, like the character of Grimm and Vakov. Uh, you know, their friendship and the friendship that Vakov has with his fellow soldiers, you know, that's very much, I lifted and looked at the way Pierce Brown, feel, you know, slotted in those those moments of friendship and those moments, you know, and these characters who did outrageous, <laughs> you know, had the guts to do this outrageous stuff out of absolutely nowhere to make a point in the most dramatic way possible. Like, <laughs> This friend doesn't write quiet scenes. He yeah, writes quiet no. in all capitals with yeah. 10 exclamation marks. <laughs> and that makes guts and it's and it's character driven and it's organic and it makes sense and it's brutally poetic. And you know, and I'm and I love that. And I tried to basically channel it through my own characters in appropriate situations. Mm. And um so and I definitely don't think I would I would be writing today if it wasn't for Pierce Brown. So I I owe him I own a few. I'm more than a few, actually. Yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, so we're now at the last question. What can we expect from Blind Space? And when we do, uh, when will when is the release date? October this later this year, October 2021. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, as I said, I just turned it in about six hours ago. <laughs> uh, I've been look. I've been basically working on it for 20, about probably 10 hours, 10 or 12 hours a day uh, for the past two weeks. My shoulders are sore, my neck is sore, my butt is sore, but it's done. It is <laughs> done. <laughs> pre it has been edited and polished up and goes to my editor, Jillian Redfern, and then I get it back and I polish it some more. Um, but yeah, it's what we expect. Um, definitely a lot more space opera elements. Mm. definitely much more there's a lot more about alien races and other species and intergalactic conflicts and the history of species and um you know th that sort of thing there's a lot more uh i will reveal this there's a scene that takes place in alien ruins that's kind of like a haunted house ah nice let's just say there are there are ais ghost ais that are, do not like trespassers let's just say <laughs> Uh, that was a thing, that. right? Um, yeah, Grim. Grim gets scared. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, there's yeah, there's a lot more. There's um, at the there's not really as much emphasis on the flashback stuff as there was in book one. Uh, but the but there is what I've been trying to do, and this is what's taken up the majority of my edits, is to have a small cast, but very very tightly focused on them. So there's about there's Vakov. Uh, Catherine and Grimm from the main book, and then there's three new characters in book two. Uh -huh. One of whom you've one of whom you've seen in book one, uh, who joined forces, and basically it's the six form this squad. Uh -huh. And I very very much like I try to do the sort of Nicholas Eames thing where I focus very much on this main cast. Mm -hmm. You learn all of them, you learn everything about them, you learn the backstories, the personalities, why they are the way they are, what they want, what they're trying to get how they interact, how they evolve, how they change, how they feel about each other. You know, that's very much the focus of the book. And uh, when I was writing Stormblood at first, I was very much focused on Vakov as a main character and his brother. Uh, that was pretty much, but then as I was writing Catherine and Grimm, I became very interested in their them and their relationship and the way they interacted and their personalities. And they started to slip in, um, but so that's definitely continued in book two, but you also have three other characters who make an appearance. And so as it, so the book is very much very, very tightly focused on them. So it's not quite as scattered with secondary characters as book one was. Like we had a, a lot of characters that we would go to and talk with for one chapter. There's less yeah. of that here. Yeah. It, you are very it's very, very much focused on these on these people and uh what else we expect? Yeah, the, as I said, the space opera elements are a lot more prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a new faction in play. There's other people in play now, a whole new 
faction kind of like the belters from the expanse ah, uh, except except they're really really into body modification and machines uh, i'm not going to say more and they don't see species basically uh, doesn't matter what species you are you're part of them doesn't matter if you're human or whatever you're part of them that's all i'm going to say okay um <laughs> it's very much inspired by the belters and uh they have a thing for zero gravity <laughs> when That's you said zero gravity, your poster fell up. I know, I know. I was like, <laughs> need to get more pack. I'm, maybe I do have a ghost here. Who knows? <laughs> and it's a, it's a very shifty looking elk. Maybe you want something. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, with especially, and I think I, I think you and a few other readers especially be interested in this. Vako's relationship with his brother takes a new turn it evolves it go it basically sees them reconnecting and how how what's happened what do we do now you know what yeah. how, what happens now what do we you know how do we move on you know it's not a rehash of book one and i say that because it is i found when i was writing this it is easy to make book two simply book one part two mm -hmm. and i wanted to avoid that i want basically every but every book that I've written acts as its own season of a TV show. Uh, yeah. uh, and oh, so yeah. this is pretty much, and this is pretty much season two. Mm. Uh, and I very much wanted it to be continuing on. Like one of the best things about Breaking Bad is that there's no, not only, there's no season that's similar, mm. but there's always consequences for yeah. what happened in the previous season always travels on to the next one. Nothing gets left by the wayside. Yeah. And so yeah. that's very much what happens here. Characters who character decisions that happen in, in the first book have consequences in book two uh, and things that happen in the first book that you weren't really sure about. Where is this leading to it? Re they rear their head here. Mm. And also you probably about also the Eva, evil alien right? alien, the Shenoi that uh, is made of storm tech. Well, let's just say they're a lot, much, much, much bigger presence in book two. Nice. <laughs> so lots and lots of aliens, lots of weird alien stuff. Well, and I'm, uh, I'm and, and of course, de <laughs> devastating emotions. Yeah. Uh, there's one scene that my uh, editor said almost made her cry. Mm. <laughs> so the, and it almost made me cry writing it. It's, it, you'll know it when you see it, but yeah. I, yeah, it was difficult to write, but it was necessary. Yeah. And uh, as, I, as I said, like, as you said at the outset, it's about brotherhood. Mm. It's about friendship. It's about people learning to look past or find redemption and to look past their errors and to try and do better and to try to be better people and find a way to each other again. Mm. And that, and it did result in this book things that i did plan and things that i didn't plan for some characters and i think that's that's organic i mean there's one relationship that came out of nowhere and demanded to be written and i didn't imagine i was going to write it at uh, all and but it's going to have it's going to have to be continued in book three because that's the way it wanted to be written and i believe books need to be written the way they want to be and there's one relationship that just took me completely by surprise but i think it people are going to like it but yeah, so basically expect everything. If you liked book one, everything you liked about it, it's it's going to be more of it. That's that's all you need to know. If you didn't, the stuff you didn't like, it's not going to be there. Just, just, just stop. <laughs> whatever you like, it's going to be more of that. That's yeah, all you need yeah. to know. <laughs> well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And so uh, we have arrived to the end of this interview. And thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming here. And please, guys, check out his book if you haven't uh, if you haven't read Stormblood. It is a very great uh, action-packed sci-fi series. And do check out the Broken Binding. It is because of the Broken Binding that this interview can be held. And once again, they're a fantastic indie bookstore. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Absolutely. Jeremy. I hope right. you will come thank again you. one one day. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Patrick. Have a good one. Yeah. Bye bye.